What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hapnes, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Benjamin Taylor, and we speak about facilitation on a very meta level, to what extent it might be manipulative and whether manipulation is a bad thing, and where is the real difference to consulting. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, scroll down to the show notes to download my free one-page summary. And now, lean back and be inspired. This Benjamin. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Yes, I'm looking forward. I've been following you on LinkedIn, seeing your comments around facilitation, always highly reflected. So... Now I'm ready to dive in. And in our exploration call, we were speaking about facilitator jargon and the woo-woo and how much of all of this is actually real. So I am, yeah, excited to dive into that one. Excellent. Yeah. I've been listening to the podcast and really enjoying it. And it's fascinating, isn't it? How many different angles there are to conversation about facilitation. So uh, hopefully we'll We'll add a couple of different dimensions today. Yes. And let's start at the beginning. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And actually, do you? I don't very often these days. I am in a facilitation space quite a lot. But I probably started when I first became a consultant. I used to work in public services uh, in the UK, and I've been in and around public services most of my career and, and had some really good training uh, back in the day, corporate training uh, catalogue of Hammersmith and Fulham London Borough Council. And I had training in train the trainer and um, some kind of core facilitation skills. And then I went to work for PwC and there was definitely a period when I was quite invested in being a facilitator amongst, of course, you know, a number of other things because uh, consultants like to think highly of themselves and, and uh, believe that they can do um, a lot of things. But these days, although I do a lot of facilitation, I probably don't have that identification anymore in my head as an identity. And I don't use it as often. Although, interestingly, I do do some teaching of uh, facilitation skills and facilitation approaches. So that's up there as a, as a heading. So I have a bit of a conflicted relationship to the word, Miriam, I think. Beautiful. You're not alone. I think most of the guests have. <laughs> and what I find interesting is to use facilitation as a consultant, because somehow I always thought that these are two so inherently different concepts. Mm. We're on the one spec end of the spectrum. You have someone, as you say, telling you what to do the consultants. On the other spectrum, those believing that all the wisdom is in the room already. I think that's I think that's right. And and that's inherent in facilitation itself, isn't it? I talk quite a lot in both my consultancy and facilitation about the work of Peter Block. And uh, he has a wonderful exercise that he does all, all the time, which I now do pretty much all the time, which is a, a community exercise, bringing people together, connecting them. And one of the things he says is don't facilitate. If you facilitate, people will think it's hard. You know, don't trick them in that way. Uh, allow them to uh, allow them to understand that they can do it themselves. And I think that's a really interesting. And as with so much that he says, um, quite provocative and, and actually quite a complex statement. If you see what I mean. And I wonder what it means. Don't facilitate because I always thought that through facilitation we actually make it easier and we help them see that they can do it alone. Yes, and this touches on the whole concept of help are we helping people uh, and that in my mind shoots off in you know about a hundred different dimensions but i think that one thing that is um really important so we can see that as are we coming at things from a deficit based perspective Are we coming at things as uh, problem solvers, fixers, filling the gap, improving people, developing people, changing people? Or are we coming at it from a strengths-based perspective, building connections, building community, valuing people for their gifts and strengths? 
Uh, Peter has a fantastic quote, the church in, I think it's Michigan, prides itself on feeding 5,000 people every day, but they've never spoken to those people. And if you if you ask those people what they're good at, what they're good at is cooking, you know. <laughs> so, and, and at the same time, somebody quoted back to me something that I once said in an online uh, conference, which was that all sufficiently developed management practices um, approach Buddhism or Taoism. In, in the sense of becoming ambivalent about what's good and bad and what counts as progress, what counts as value and uh, accepting defeat and failure just the same as, as, as two types of um, imposters. So I was listening to a, a great podcast um, yesterday, Daniel Thorson's Emerge podcast, which was talking about the distinction from Heidegger, would you believe? I'm, I can't claim to understand or have read Heidegger, but th this is a really important distinction between um, the mechanistic orientation, which is potentially seeing the whole world as a resource to be put to a use to achieve some kind of an end, versus the poetic orientation, which is valuing inherent goodness, I would say cheerfulness, positivity, beauty, uh, and so on in its own right. Um, so I think there are some quite fine distinctions here where what we would love to do, but we shouldn't then, we can't get at it by instrumentalizing it. What we would love to do as facilitators is to take that strengths-based community approach um, and find ways to create beauty and enable, no, enable beauty <laughs> and, and connections and compensation for the weak weaknesses of each other with strengths. But it is one of those things that if you try to achieve it by intentionality and by efforting, you know, then you're undermining the whole point. You're treating it as an instrumental goal. But if you can actually get into that Zen space of allowing it and connecting and, and, and uh, supporting somehow and enabling, then it might occur. Then, then, then it might happen. <laughs> Thank you. And it's, yeah, there's a lot of stuff and a lot to unpack. At some point, I saw the this difference between yeah consulting and facilitation, where mm -hmm. the facilitation comes in with creating the spaces where this emergence, the strength space approach can happen, whereas consulting must come, I think, by definition from a place of scarcity, because they need to be needed. That's a business model. Then. There is not enough and we do need to help to fill that gap and to fill that void with knowledge that is missing. Whereas for me, facilitation comes from a place of abundance. And yes, I understand that by if we force it, so if we force it, then we we won't achieve it. I think that's the catch-22 that you were just explaining. That's On right. the other hand, yeah. and I think there's a distinction here because if – we want to create connection because we want it, then it's our goal. And I think then we are abusing facilitation, which is to be in service of the group. So the Zen way <laughs> to let go, to surrender, to create the space for the people and to mm. trust that in the space something will emerge. I think that's a pure facilitation way. I mean, these things are definitional, To uh, I would say. Uh, there's no point having an argument about it in the sense that you can approach. Uh, if I think about the book, The Skilled Helper, or the book, The Skilled Facilitator, or not wanting to just sort of be Peter Block's representative on earth, but the book, Flawless Consulting, those are about bringing that abundance, perhaps, but partnering, alongside a strengths-based approach to consultancy. Uh, I, mm. I, I would say. So I do think it is possible, very challenging, particularly with, you know, a lot of the times the way we're employed, the way we're contracted, the way the businesses uh, work and so on. But I think it is conceptually possible uh, to approach consultancy in the way that you're describing uh, under the word facilitation, whereby mm. the purpose is not to fill a knowledge gap, but to align with somebody who is trying to make a decision achieve something in their business and partner with them and learn about their system together mm. based on your shared expertise, which is something different from, from facilitation, but I do think is carrying through that fundamental approach that we've, that we've just been talking about, if you see what I mean. Um, yeah. 
I talk a lot about, and I think this is really a useful input to facilitation in both Peter Block and Barry Oshry, and it's really interesting, and we, we, we might even touch on this, that so many of the gurus, and I, I will call them that, appreciating that that's cultural appropriation and in some contexts could be offensive, but they are these big figures, are white Jewish men, uh, not, and then there's, that opens up a whole complicated uh, space, but they're, they're, they're Jewish Americans of a certain period. And I was, I've been so touched by Barry Oshry's story that he grew up incredibly discriminated against on the outskirts of Boston. And just as he was, uh, he was uh, coming of age as a teenager, discovered the horrors of the Holocaust. And so many of those people of that period in America with that heritage were behind the human potential movement and the whole development of organizational development as a concept, which so many of our facilitation, consultancy, management ideas come from, either a kind of pure version or a, or a very twisted uh, version in these days. But two of my heroes, Barry Oshry and, and, and Peter, independently, I think, came up with different models about the, when you enter into a space as a consultant, you are faced with this pressure to be of immediate use because you know less about the system of the client than they do and you're in a vulnerable position. So you've been hired, so you can be fired. You're in there as a guest, as a special invitee into their space. And very often this does pertain obviously in facilitation. The instinct when you're vulnerable and you know less about the system then is to be of immediate use. And the ways to be of immediate use are either to be a leader, uh, a director, telling them, giving your expertise, this is how you should do something, or a servant, tell me what to do, how can I be helpful, how can I make myself helpful to you? And they point out that both of those routes are routes to failure, to being abused and misused, uh, to being rejected by the system ultimately, because you're not adding your true value. Um, and that the, the necessity as a consultant, and now then let's, I'd love your perspective on how much this rings true as a facilitator, um, is not to be of immediate use as an expert or a servant, but to um, hold the space, hold the tension, and get alongside your client and look at their system together, uh, as I said before, so that you're bringing your expertise, which is probably what you've been hired for, but their understanding of their context together and working as a team to help them to achieve whatever they're trying to achieve. Th does that make sense? I think I lost you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you lost me. Sorry. Well, let, let me try. Let me try again one more time. When you come in from the outside as a consultant, you're in a vulnerable position, and you know less about the space, about the client's world than they do about their system. The temptation in that context is to be of immediate use, and the way to be of immediate use when you don't really know their system is either to be the expert, preach best practice, and tell them what to do or to be the servant and just do whatever they direct you to, to be of use. And both of those things put you in an even more vulnerable position, actually, and usually end up with you being ejected and feeling that your expertise has been misused. Quite, quite, quite right. That's right. And the prescription is, instead of bowing to that pressure to be of immediate use and snapping into one of those two roles, to, 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 to hold that tension and to hold back and to get alongside the client and look at their system together with your shared expertise. Yeah. And I think there's something to that, which is a lesson that carries into facilitation as well, if that, if that does make any sense. Yeah. So this is what I would call facilitation. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And this is for me why the neutrality is so important. Yeah. Because you don't have stakes in the outcome yeah. and no ownership in the outcome. Yeah. I think that's really interesting. And of course, neutrality can come through having no stake or through your relationship to the stake, can't, can't it? You can. It's not normal for people to achieve a different relationship to incentives. But we've just described that in order to be a, to have a facilitated approach, you need to have a different relationship to the incentives of the position. You need to not be pulled into being of immediate use and trying to prove yourself. So I think even when you have a, a brief and, you know, you're in there because they want to achieve a certain outcome, it's still possible to partner in that way and to take uh, that facilitative approach, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think this is maybe where also the concept of facilitation as a mindset comes in with um, in terms of trusting that the group does have knowledge and can come to solutions and might need guidance. 
And I think the reason why we, why we scheduled this call or what, uh, what we wanted to explore was, and I think this is, um, this conversation or what you were just sharing points at it, that there is this view of the consultant as someone who gets a high pay, is strong, has something to say, has impact. Yeah. And then there's this view of the facilitator who comes in with sticky notes and a little bit of music and lots of woo-woo, doesn't get enough paid and is weak. And I want because for me in my perspective, it's the facilitator is extremely powerful, but stays in the background and isn't part of the real conversation. And I think if it's if it's very if the facilitator did a very good job, nobody will ever speak about the facilitator again because they think that they didn't even need them. Whereas a consultant did a great job <laughs> if their brand and their logo is stamped on every page of the strategy. <laughs> Not all consultants think that way. I think we need to break break away from this dichotomy. But it's yeah, really, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, so, what is it, and yeah. why does do does facilitation has such a bad, or sometimes such a bad connotation? Or well, I think part of that is the element of cringe that we've come to expect from a lot of facilitation. You gave some definitions, the the, the post its and so on. I I could I could add, you know. That they might have um, a Tibetan singing bowl to um, to mark the end of the sessions. I, I haven't got one of those. I've got similar devices though, but I certainly know some uh, facilitators who, who 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 do have them. And I think one of the aspects, and it, and it's only one of the aspects, and it might mask something else, is that there are tropes and cliches and kind of groan-inducing things that facilitators often do, and that have now been spotted as techniques. As things that we're doing by a lot of groups, not every group, because it's always different every time. And so I think I think that's one aspect that I want to name that facilitators kind of become very cringy <laughs> and, and, sl- and rather cliched, and that people are now wise to that. They're spotting us coming and reacting to that. Where do you think is this coming from? Because I I remember the early days when I started the podcast. Mm. Words or terms like holding space or, yeah, there were so many words or concepts that were very alien to me. And now I use them as everyone else. Yeah, yeah. Or building a container. There was another one where I was in the beginning like, okay, so we hold space and we build containers. What is that? Very intangible language. And we cannot use it for external, for clients, although very often we forget that not the entire world understands facilitation jargon. Is there something similar in the consulting world? And where does it come from that it's so strong in amongst facilitators? There certainly is something similar in the consulting world and probably in line with the expectations of facilitators and consultants that you talked about earlier. I think it would be taken, it's, it's taken with facilitation as a kind of amusing embarrassment and with consultants much more cynically. I think the equivalent cliches for consultants would be, I probably won't even go into naming them because that might not be a useful use of time, but would be more, would be more cynical, would be more negative, would be seeing the consultant's intent um, as more aggressive, whereas the facilitator's intent is seen as... Uh, Uniting. Well, well, not negative, but also not necessarily welcome, exposing perhaps, putting people into a discomfort zone or just something that you've, you've, you've done many times before. So what drives that, I think, what drives these things becoming cringy? And, and by the way, I, you know, I think holding space and building a container are deeply meaningful, really, really important concepts, you know, yes. actually. <laughs> I think there's a few things that drive. So one is over familiarity, right? So the first time you break a taboo in a certain way is powerful and exposing and challenging and threatening. The seventh time somebody invites you to break a taboo by, you know, getting rid of the chairs and standing in a circle, it's like, oh yeah, I've done this before. You know, you, 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 do you see what I mean? And if the facilitator thinks they're doing something really powerful, 
but you're like, yeah, but we did this three weeks ago um, with, with that other facilitator, then they are in the um, position of their attempt to gain a certain status in a social dynamic has failed and been exposed. So there's, a, there's an equivalent there. So one thing I think is over familiarity. And I just want to add to that, that I think people doing facilitation at a very surface level mm. and, and doing it with the intent of achieving, because you can instrumentalize, you know, a, a really good facilitator might fade into the background, but, you know, certain really skilled facilitators have a certain social status. So you can instrumentalize going into facilitation to try and achieve that social status. Do you see what I mean? And you can instrumentalize facilitators tropes to just have a more interesting meeting rather than doing genuine holding space. Um, so I think those two things go together a little bit. Yeah. And it's funny that because for the, I would say that the circle, standing or sitting in a circle is an as powerful concept as the idea of holding space. And I think it's, yeah. I think, an important part of holding space. Yes. The removal of obstacles and the creation of transparency and the facing yeah. each other literally. So, and being an equal relation to each other. Yes, yes, absolutely. So I wonder whether it's then the attitude or what you said that it's the how mature we are in facilitation, whether we come with it, oh, let's do something taboo and expecting a big wow or a shock, whereas the participants think, well, that's what you yeah. guys do. Yeah, I um, think that's, great. that's a really good observation. I, th I think the intent and the skill capability the the, the 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 practice behind it do make all the difference absolutely absolutely because for me it's um it would rather be the opposite that if i put the chairs in a circle and the client is surprised that i'm surprised about their surprise i'm like are you really telling me that i'm the first person doing this with you or to you yeah 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 Although that still happens sometimes, doesn't it? That's the fast that is the fascinating thing. We can never make assumptions, in my experience, yeah. about the exposure of clients to this kind of thing. And sometimes the dynamic can be from from the other direction. You know, I've done quite a lot of challenging things uh, in, in in my life. I've done re rejection therapy and shamanic trance dance, and you know, forming in front of people in all kinds of ways which can either boost your ego or hopefully help you to lose your sense of self-importance. And sometimes you can simply stride into a client space and say, right, let's, you know, move around the space in this way, or let's do this in this way. And, and it's not, it's not, it's perfectly normal to you, but it's an incredible shock to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that can still happen in my experience, you know, however much we think these things are cliche. So it can work on the, it can, it can work on the other side as well, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then, and you used the word cliche to what, what makes a cliche a cliche and what makes it so bad? That's a really good question. I think a cliche becomes a cliche and becomes bad when you can only relate to it as a trope. And it's, it's become so familiar that you can no longer relate to the underlying meaning and intent behind it. And the trope, the cliche, the, the repetitive, the, oh, of course, the facilitator is doing this, fills the field of vision. And that's, that's, that becomes the only object of a focus, if, if you see what I mean. Yeah, because then it takes also the, the meaning and the purpose away from it. That's it. And I think that's yeah. why I find it actually very sad when I hear all these facilitator cliche and, and jokes. And yes, of course, I laugh because many of them are very true. And we talked about the, uh, the shit facilitator on X, formerly Twitter. Mm -hmm. But it makes me cringe because these are important concepts. So I think what's interesting about that, yeah, I mean, I end my facilitation training with the quote from that, that Twitter account. Um, I regret to inform you that although we put a pin in it, we never circled back. <laughs> which is such a good summation of, of a kind of facilitation cliche. So that we, we can't stop that from happening. We can't stop the over-familiarization and the degradation of the value, both through over-familiarity of sincere practice and through surface-level practice. Um, nor can we kind of get into some kind of innovation arms race of coming up with new things and new ways of doing it that will refresh and have the same impact as, as, as in those kind of early days. So we have to find another way, don't we? And, okay, so one possibility is to let go of a lot of things 
and to and this might be very naive or it might be a very advanced facilitation technique is to facilitate much less allow much more space allow much more self-organization use far fewer techniques um, use far fewer structured activities and help people um, just by shaping and supporting what they're doing and a conversation and an, and an engagement and yeah that's one possibility and what just what brought this up is maybe also where the cliche or the um comes from or people laughing about it that mm. if something if we are trying to over facilitate adults it can feel very patronizing and sure and if we then come with icebreakers and silly games uh, yeah it we can put people in a very uncomfortable place where i think if we just stick to the ground rules of facilitation to help groups to listen to each other ask curious questions and to defer judgment this takes most of them out of their comfort zone enough they don't need any touchy feely games around it I think and that's I, right. yeah and i think what you say that um most groups lead less facilitation that's then the high art because i remember i i was working with a with a client and i wasn't even aware of the impact the art of facilitation had or the way i did it until ways after when they told me that they were used to a command and control micromanaging way of working and then i came in i was like okay so You do this, here are the instructions, and you find, and then they ask questions, but how do we do that? And where do we go? And like, look around, you'll find some people and you find absolutely. a way. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. they found this experience transformational because they, the managers realized that their people have actually creativity and self -organ organizing skills that they didn't even expect. Yep. Yeah, and 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 therefore the form of the session has a lesson in itself and is a vital part of the outcomes, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, and maybe that's something that you often forget that there are always I, different absolutely. components and levels. I absolutely agree. That, no, that's great. That's really powerful. I, 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 just to go back to something you said a, a little earlier, I think you put your finger on the fact you know people are resistant to as soon as people latch on to the fact that you are trying to shape their experience then that triggers some of these defensive you know that triggers the cliche triggers the the social derision and so on so it's so the fact of feeling staged going on. exactly exactly nicely put yeah 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 and, and I mean, I have, yeah sorry mm -hmm. after you i was just thinking back to what you said earlier that um There's so much willingness to create this collaborative spirit and this free space. Yeah. That there is a tendency then to force it onto people, which then destroys actually the space we wish to create. Nicely put. I, I absolutely agree with that. So I think it's worth saying that even when I am sort of talking about the apparent tools of, of facilitation wearing down and becoming blunt and becoming you know less useful i think there's still a lot of space to be filled in and developed and explored in terms of actual you know straightforward facilitation skills that even in the 60s would have been recognized as such and would have been useful and so on you know i absolutely love the differentiation and integration theory that uh, sandrianov um, uses uh, a lot um from uh, asgavarian Uh, if I've pronounced the name correctly, I absolutely love the power of naming the thing. Um, one of the great observations in in uh, flawless consulting about when you're in a negotiation with a client and you're stuck, one of the power moves you can do is say, "We seem to be stuck," <laughs> um, and, and and just naming and bringing into consciousness what everybody's thinking is, is you know. The, so there's a lot of actual facilitation skills that are still that that, that, that still have juice in them <laughs> that are filling in the space that are adding value that are kind of really helping people. Yeah. Yeah, and making the implicit explicit. And by, I think what facil good facilitators do very well is leading by courage. So because to sit in a in a meeting, in a high stakes meeting, and to say, I think we're stuck, 
is a courageous move. Well, yes, but that's where you build. That's where in order to be an effective facilitator, so, so you need to be in a place, well, <laughs> you need to be in a place where that move is available to you. That's the point. And, and I think if, if you're in the place where that move is available to you and it's courageous, that's mm. one thing. But then there's a different space where that move is available to you and it's not courageous for you at all because you are you have that distance from, from, from the social dynamics of the group. And I wonder whether this now links back to what you said earlier about the consultant being in this weak position that either they have to be, I wouldn't say liked, but appreciated and included, and the facilitator doesn't need that. And That's this right. That's creates right. liberty yeah. to then do but these But the good outcomes. consultant doesn't need that either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so that, you know, I, I, I used a little sneaky quote from Kipling earlier on to, to treat success and failure as, as two imposters that, that are actually similar. And there's that level of detachment, if you see what I mean, that's really, really useful. Mm. That's a super power that you can bring into a situation and that can help to surface things and so on. But by the way, it's also important that you don't get hung up on your power to surface things, right? There's a fantastic piece by Marvin Weisbord who partnered with Sandra Yanov for, uh, I mean, they were life partners and, and, and worked together in future search and the like for, for, uh, for decades. And I think it's techniques to match our values, but there's a, there's a number of great papers that he's written. And he, he makes the point that, and actually this is in uh, their book, Don't Just Do Something the Stand There. Stand there. Yeah, uh, which, is, which is let people hide their hidden agendas. So when you transcend the enmeshment in, in, in embarrassment and, and social value to some extent, you, you know, you know, you're still a human being. Um, uh, you can get really high on, <laughs> high on your own supply if you're not careful uh, and really go around, you know, lifting up rocks and surfacing hidden agendas and waking sleeping dogs. And at a certain stage, you've got, you, you've got to say you can do that or you can not do that. And that's an important thing to have a neutral relationship to as well, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, does it serve? Does it serve the group? Does it serve the purpose? And is it necessary? There is, I don't know who came up with these questions. Is it true? Is it necessary? And is it kind? Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Before saying something or engaging in something. And I think yeah. revealing hidden agendas can sometimes be true, but maybe it's not necessary or it's not kind. And then there might be other ways. And in other times, it is maybe the kindest thing you can do for the group. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, and it, it's, it's really, really hard to make legible, to systematize when that would be the right move and when that would be the wrong move. It's maybe impossible, you know, <laughs> like most ethical decisions, I suppose. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, because it's then there's this thing like gut feeling or just sensing what's the right thing to do right now. According to you, what makes a workshop fail? As soon as you say that, given the conversation we've been having, I'm immediately thinking that failure is always relative. So it, it will entirely depend on your frame, uh, what the answer to that question is. One of my favorite quotes along the lines of the Kipling thing that I quoted earlier is um, Bob Dylan, who said, uh, he's got these two lines. Um, you say you believe that you're better than no one and no one is better than you. If you really believe that, you know, you've got nothing to win and nothing to lose. And so, you know, a workshop breaking down in complete disarray and frustration and failure and bitterness is probably a really terrible outcome, but it might cause the right kind of conversations and the right kind of introspection and work or change in the organization that actually turns out to be a net, a net, really, net really positive. So it really does depend on the framing. And on the perspective. And on the perspective. Because yeah. what you just yeah. described, I can see how the organization or the team can really win because the shit hit the fan. That's right. <laughs> and now That's right. they have yeah. they're confronted with the situation. From the perspective of the facilitator, they might not be invited again. <laughs> <laughs> or they might cringe. Yes. Yes. I'll be devastated. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I've certainly got a list of facilitation moments that you know occasionally 
keep me awake at night. Like, oh God, why did I do that? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but there you go. That's the, that's the social anxiety uh, thing to uh, really clearly, isn't it? I, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, what we can say fairly securely is, that is, is, is a workshop failing is, is, is everybody having, you know, really wasted their time. Um, and I think that can, that can happen through over-engineering. Uh, it can happen through general bad management, trying to do too much, um, allowing one, you know, there's, there's some very obvious, you know, early level facilitation points, like, you know, allowing one person to dominate in an incredibly boring way. So, you know, but obviously there are loads of ways that a workshop can really fail. And I, I don't think that I have one kind of unifying theme for that, if, if, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, I, I don't think there's an easy answer to that question, Miriam, really. <laughs> it does, so the, the question is, um, it's one of my favourite questions to ask on the podcast because it mm. always brings up new perspectives on what is failure, what is the role of a facilitator. So it's not yeah. about is there one answer, but rather how do we approach the question? And yeah. what just came up for me is um, when you describe this this disastrous workshop that can be actually a win. I wouldn't, because there's so much growth potential in there. Yeah. And then what you described at the waste of time, waste of time during the workshop, but also from a later perspective. So there's really nothing to almost reminds me. I don't know why this comes up in my mind, but um, a saying that the opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. Right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so the opposite of a successful workshop with bright ideas and outcomes and innovation isn't the complete failure mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of disaster, but yeah. it's just this indifference well, where nothing we has go, changed. You, you, you know, we could go a lot closer to your original statement as well. Growth potential was the thing that you named. And so, you know, a workshop is a failure um, if it, generate zero growth potential. That would be a, a, a nice way of putting it um, as well, I think. I, I, I do want to make a point. You know, I, I talked earlier about some of the cliches arise because people take the surface level of the facilitation technique or trope without understanding the intent. And I do think that there is um, some risk of people walking into... I, I draw a distinction. It's, it's a terribly elitist distinction in a way so i'm not completely comfortable with it but i think there is a difference between shallow facilitation and deep facilitation and i think knowing which one you're doing is is actually quite important so there's nothing wrong with being a shallow facilitator grabbing one of the liberating structures and having a slightly more interesting and slightly more productive meeting with post-its instead of a very boring sit-down meeting but where i see a definite risk is people accidentally and without preparation or capability or being able to hold the container getting into deep facilitation you know just just wading in there with, 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 without realizing if, if that makes sense this makes a lot of sense and i think the way you put it of what a cliche is and how it arises i think was on point that it's using concepts that have depth but not going into depth and not seeing yeah. it. Yeah. 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 And yeah, if someone comes in after watching a YouTube video on facilitation, or I think there are many courses on facilitation that teach techniques and tools and don't touch the inner work or even the deeper meaning of these tools and what they can do to a group and individuals. Yeah. And then they run off and believe yeah. that they can do deep facilitation with shallow tools. I think that's very, that's very dangerous because we might open a yeah, Pandora's agreed. box. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some would say that the deep facilitation that's invisible could sound like the most manipulative type of facilitation, if you, if you see what I mean. And I think so it is. It's interesting that on the other side, yeah, it's it, it, um, yeah, it's manipulating people's frames and perspectives and experience uh, and so on, isn't it? So it's our job. Super clear about that. It's what? Sorry. It's our job, and it yeah. doesn't mean that it's negative. I think manipulation no, no, no. has a very negative connotation. But yeah. if we want to transform perspectives and change people's lives, how else to do? if not through manipulation. 
I mean, I think I think it's important. There is something in there about if challenged, if held to account, or if the moment is right, would you be able to bring to consciousness and to bring to legibility and share with other people how they're being manipulated? Do, do, do you see what I mean? Is that potentially available to the participants in the session to inquire into, or is it completely obscure from them? Do you see what I mean? Not sure. Right. So I think that it's mu- that kind of manipulation is more defensible if you could, if called to account, know how you're manipulating mm. people yes. and share with them how you're manipulating Absolutely. them and, and they wouldn't be angry. <laughs> and, I often, and I often actually do, I must say. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I would yeah, yeah. I would ask the group, so why did we do that? <laughs> yeah. Yep. And so the standing or sitting in a circle. Is very is a very manipulative act, right? That, yeah, absolutely, and and that's partly what people are reacting to, as as we said before, because they they become aware of it and they think, hang on, I'm being I'm being manipulated. Yeah. But then, if you allow consent and and you can, yeah, I think it's a great technique to ask people why and to 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 explore why. And on the other hand, yeah. <laughs> and on the other hand, having rows of um, of chairs with a stage and a big picture of a speaker is as manipulative but in a different way absolutely yeah absolutely absolutely and i remember i was just so fascinated if you remember rebel wisdom and the video channel and uh, they were part of the intellectual dark web or something like that um for a while and they they held the closing ceremony they closed out their thing and it was very mindful and very deliberate but, you know it's, it's the end and uh they they held this campfire gathering in london and i would have been quite interested to attend i wasn't particularly i was interested in their in, in some of their material and so on but i saw some coverage of it and it was called the campfire but there was a circle of chairs around the stage with people up on the stage and speakers, you know, <laughs> so it's just like it was, it was the opposite of, 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 of that, from that image of, of what was described. So that, that's an example. And you're absolutely right. My mum used to quote, settings have plans for their occupants. And one of the things I always teach in facilitation training is to, is to be aware of the implications. You know, the meeting is the message, right? Very similar to what you said said before, the implications of the space carry a message and and there's some technical you know systems language for that that they they create context cues that shape our behavior yeah so it's all about bringing to awareness manipulation and shaping perhaps we should use a more neutral word than manipulation but priming that is what it is as you say yes and I, <laughs> I mean i come from the i have an academ- academic background in behavioral economics right so reading studies where you would find that people behave more honestly yeah if you just put a pair of eyes above their screen and suddenly yep. they stop cheating because they feel watched if something as subtle not even subtle <laughs> like this has significant change on behavior and how honest we are towards a computer screen i think um everything we do and i, I think for me that's that's also what I love about facilitation. Everything that we do has a purpose and helps the group achieve their goal to open up and to have these conversations that otherwise they wouldn't have. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's right. And in a way, you could have a, a, a very valid definition Definition of facilitator is somebody who works intentionally to shape con- context, isn't it? Yes. And that could be very occult if, you, if, you're, if you're not careful. But there is that that, that level of, of being accountable for that um, that, that, that we brought in. I think I think it could be fun to play with. <laughs> yeah, and I think that indeed, for instance, I think great cult leaders are great facilitators. Must be. Yeah. Maybe they don't. Well, at least on the surface level, maybe they not always have the best attention for the group. Yeah. But I think the skill, um, what they're using, and then it's. Even when you look at religious movements, they also rely on facilitation skills or use what it takes to bring people closer together to each other, to themselves, to their spiritual calling. A friend of mine is at one of the great big, almost revivalist, like Tony Robbins events right as we speak right now. And that's a great example where, depending on your awareness of context shaping, you are, I mean, you're going into that to be manipulated. 
you know, I, I went to one, I got manipulated. I was on an incredibly healthy diet and, and thin and full of energy and amazing for about five years till it wore off. <laughs> but I was very conscious. I probably missed a lot, but I was very conscious of loads of the ways that we were being manipulated in the mm. session. And, and not everybody was in the same kind of way, you know, so but that, that was the sole purpose of the event in a way, wasn't it? Very true. And as you say, I think everyone who signs up for a Tony Robbins event, and I think Landmark is similar, I signed up for Landmark, I was very consciously manipulated and learned a lot about effective facilitation. Yes, yes. about myself. Well, it comes from the same roots. Landmark, yeah. um, which I you know, have some concerns about, personally. For good very, reasons. Right, very, very directly comes from the encounter groups and the tea groups that were developed in... Um, pointing to California uh, <laughs> in the, the beginning of the of the human potential movement, which went into MK Ultra in the CIA um, and went into your and I kind of, um, you know, co cozy learning circles, went into case in point practice in adaptive leadership and so on. So we really have to be really conscious of the uh, dark side. Uh, occult is a good word because it's hidden, it's, it's manipulative, it's dark. That, that comes along with all of this. But really important to say, those people who, who are anti-facilitation, you know, have always got a context, just like you're talking about in, in behavioral insights, that there, there is always a context that's shaping behavior, whether it's intentionally designed or not, isn't it? So what's so terrible about intentionally designing the context? Yeah, isn't it interesting? <laughs> Because, for instance, when someone intentionally designs the context of a dinner invitation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would anyone feel manipulated because they're having a good time and because someone thought of where they would sit and what they would eat and what music they play and how the decoration yeah. contributes to the experience? And I think it becomes manipulative if it's either if it's not intentional or it becomes cringy, either if it's not well designed and intentional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can see through, and it's a nice try, but yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But by the way, I think there's probably some mileage now, now that facilitation has become so visible and known and all the rest, in going back to some really old school facilitation, because I think um, some of that, you know, setting out the tables and getting activities and all the rest of it, I think for some people now that would be really refreshing and kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I've been to some workshops like this 20 years ago. <laughs> would it, can you give an example? You know, um, going through a process of intentional organization design with principles and dot voting and prioritization and then options creation and all the rest, you know, I haven't, I haven't done that recently because it became a trope that people were kind of familiar with. But mm. I, I think, I think now, just like if you hosted now a 1970s dinner party, it would be really quite, quite fun and interesting. <laughs> I think now in facilitation, you could go back to something like that. And people would go, oh yeah, this is this is fresh, or at least it's interesting. It's different, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, and, and it would work because because now you know what I'm saying in a way is if you suddenly did a facilitation where the manipulation was quite strong but very very clear to people, they'd probably play along with it, and it would probably work quite nicely. Mm. The shaping was quite strong. <laughs> yeah, how the things uh, always come back, but then in a new shape or form. Um, exactly. That's that's it. That's it. Yeah, I think I, I, that's 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 right. Yeah, and I think the um, level of trust is. This would just came up for me. How how much are you trusted by the group as a facilitator? Whether they'll follow you into this manipulative process. That that that's right, and and that's always um, an important factor at play, isn't it? And it's not necessarily again that high trust is just better than low trust. I have a few warm-up activities which reveal me as being untrustworthy, where I'm kind of playing a small trick on people, and then they realize it, and you know, then I say, you know, it's, you know, so don't don't assume that I always completely know what I'm doing. Don't assume that I'm completely trustworthy. Um, I am here for a good reason and trying to achieve the results. But I mean, I don't say all those words, but you know, I'm quite defensive about that manipulation capability. And if I'm in a situation where there's a potential for me to manipulate people, I'm going to really try and make that clear and put them on warning and put them on, on, on guard. And hopefully in a positive way. I mean, a friend of mine got a job. He's an incredible facilitator and, and, and uh, uh, counselor and coach and, and, and so on. He got a job for 
I won't say which organization, but an organization that uh, 15, 20 years ago was at the real cutting edge of kind of human centered organizations with a charismatic leader with a fantastic book and all the rest of it. And all of these people were signed up as associates and as, as part of delivering this great big movement. And the leader of that movement got up on the stage and was doing the introduction for them and all the rest. And one of the things, first things he said was, read every letter of your contract, make sure that you really understand the legal contract you're entering into, because if I can screw you, I will. And it was like, what? <laughs> WTF? And he was a manipulator. This wasn't a way of, you know, trying to establish boundaries where, you know, you look after yourself and uh, not of non-dependence, if you, if, you see, if you see what I mean. But I think a, a dose of that, because too much trust is building a dependent relationship, isn't it? Yes. That's, that's my point. Yes. That's what yeah. I like what you're saying also to to avoid the leadership bias in a facilitated process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there is always the tendency, especially when it's getting uncomfortable, to then turn to someone um, in the hope that they know the answer or yeah. whatever. What is your intention behind this first activity where you say that you kind of break, where you show yourself in a light that you must I mean, not I, necessarily trust it? Well, I want a meta level of trust where, you know, there's a basic trust that we're in it together and that we're trying to achieve the same kind of thing. But I want them to understand that there's a possibility that me as the facilitator could be manipulating. Mm. Um, or is shaping, you know, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure exactly what is behind that. Maybe I can't make it completely clear to myself. And partly it's guarding against me being tempted to use my power for evil, uh, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So th yeah. Th does that make sense? You know, um, totally. Um, yeah. And where, where there's a choice, I'm always uh, aiming for inter independence, mm -hmm. where, you know, everybody is fundamentally independent. And I think that's a great, you know, that, that frees you from a lot if you really are able to take that perspective. But we're interacting and, and working together. Yeah, a very grounded relationship. Yeah. Between grown ups. Yeah. Where everyone is responsible, I mean, autonomous. Exactly. Ad adult to adult. Yeah. 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 And, and if you can create the circumstance where you're saying, yeah, I'm in this role. And I'm creating the context and, you know, having a lot of responsibility for creating the context. But I'm only going to do that on the basis that we're interacting as, e yeah. as adults, as equals. That's, uh, that, that's, that's really important, isn't it? Obviously, yeah. it's valuable if you, can, if you can do it. I like that. And it reminds me of um, a conversation I had with, um, I think it was Tom Goldhand. And he is, um, I interviewed him because he's a dance instructor. Oh, nice. So he facilitates dances, um, dance courses, and also ecstatic dance. And what I loved about of what he said was that there are manipulative activities that make it so easy for everyone to just melt into the space, forget about themselves, and just have this thirst for connection. So eye gazing, for instance. And he says that it's something that It's so easy to to manipulate an entire group into a state of mind where you want to have them that he shies away and he would never do it. And I found this, yeah, very, it was a good wake up call because there are these activities yeah. that are easy because they just speak to our human nature. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I really mm -hmm. gravitate to, to simple activities, a couple of boxes, a couple, couple of flip charts, you know, more and more, the less, maybe I'm just tired, but <laughs> the less over preparation and stuff involved and the more fundamental it is, the better. Yeah. I think nowadays I spend most time thinking of the prompting question. Nice. Yeah. That I invite groups to, because that's that's all what it takes. And then giving them the opportunity to speak and share about a question and And helping them to learn how to listen and how to speak. Mm. Don't need more. No. no. Maybe that's the most manipulative act to give people the, <laughs> the sensation how it feels to be listened to and heard and yeah, yeah, of course it is. understood of course it is, in, in a way. You know, it's interesting because with all of this, one of the things that I still haven't quite cracked in my facilitation work is when people are like reporting back in, even if we're in a circle or whatever, mm -hmm. getting them to orientate themselves to report to the group, not to me. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I wonder whether it's a personality type thing. And I wonder whether it's um, discomfort or insecurity. 
because addressing especially when it's um, yeah. it's yeah. a group yeah. of colleagues and yeah. then addressing it to you makes it a little bit less vulnerable maybe could be actually that's really interesting yeah and i i hear what you say always yeah. what i then try is to not look at them but look at all the others <laughs> try to get yes. the person then also look at others yeah yeah difficult. Sure. yeah and, um, and in a way if you were really committed to development and you'd created enough of a safe container for somebody who might be vulnerable in that situation to to participate in this what you'd want to do is is use that as as, as in an encounter group or, or case in point learning or something to, to pause the action say just to solve hold on a second let's just take a sidebar yeah Who are you talking to in giving this report back out and, and why? And, and make a conversation about that. Yeah. That, could, that could be very developmental if the circumstances were right. Can. And I think you have to be very skilled for that because what you don't yeah. want is that the person then feels dismissed about the content that they wanted to share. Yeah, absolutely. Or put on the spot and, yeah. and kind of maybe even humiliated. You know, yeah. if, if, yeah. if the feeling if the vibe was wrong. By the way, I, I use the word vibes quite a lot in facilitation. Uh, it's, it's being used a bit on Twitter, and and it's, it's such a nice throwback word to the 1970s that encapsulates so much of that energy and holding space and so on. About you know what are the vibes like in the in the mm. room? But that can work quite well as a liberating way to have people talk about the non-visible, the non-tractable part yeah. of the meeting. Yeah. yeah. Good one. What remains your number one facilitation challenge? Not trying to show how clever I am. <laughs> Not to what? Not trying to show how clever I am. <laughs> so okay. humility. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. You know, you get into these rooms, into these spaces, in my experience, and I think in a lot of people's experience, through ambition and through, I mean, I love the performance aspect of, of any kind of being on stage, facilitating, presenting, and all of those kind of things. And uh, nothing wrong with that um, and, and so on. But actually, it's to show how clever you are or those kind of ego things certainly are a distraction and another issue that's not part of real good facilitation. I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. And I, I can totally relate, and especially when, in my case, when I'm extremely passionate about something, And then I just want to share it and yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Well, I mean, I often say it's the same in business. Caring about a topic is to a certain extent uh, uh, disabling, you know, so, mm. so you, can, you can often be a really great facilitator when you really don't care. <laughs> um, It's 22. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Isn't, isn't that interesting? It's like a mic dropping moment. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. It's been really, really fascinating. Really, really interesting. Yeah. Juicy conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Pleasure. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you for staying tuned and for listening until the very end. I hope that you found the inspiration and the wisdom that you are looking for. And I hope that you will subscribe to the show so that you never miss any of the interviews with in another inspiring facilitator from across the world. I am devoted to continue this podcast and to deliver weekly an episode that maintains the quality that you expect and you deserve. And if you would like to help me to maintain this quality and to keep the podcast free, please help us visit workshops.work slash support to make a small donation to keep the podcast free. Thank you so much. I hope to be in your ears next week.